Life is full of mysteries. And uh, one of life's mysteries is how some people just smile at each other and they become pregnant. And yet for others, it can be a long, difficult and stressful process. In the first category comes a Russian man called Fyodor Vasiliev. He and his first wife are alleged to hold the record for the most children a couple has sort of parented. She gave birth, hold on to your seats, to a total of 69 children. But that's not the good part. 16 pairs of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quadruplets. And 67 of the 69 children are said to have survived infancy. Half the Centrelink budget blown on one family. But not to be discouraged, Fyodor allegedly had six sets of twins and two sets of triplets with a second wife for another 18 children. Now, the site that I referenced this from uh, in a, says in a rather understated way uh, that the claim is disputed, as records in the 18th century weren't that well kept. I would suggest that after one or three vodkas, Fyodor was prone to a bit of barroom boasting, which never included, if you've noticed, the mentioning of his wife by name. 69 kids, and she's the heroine of the piece as far as I can work out, and all she's known as is the first Mrs. Vasiliev. In the other category, the one that many couples go through is Abraham's family. We've already seen in previous weeks the great difficulty that Abraham and Sarah had in sort of conceiving Isaac. And things have been no easier for Isaac and Rebecca. While it's only taken us a week to get from Isaac and Rebecca's marriage to the birth of their twin sons, it's been 20 years of trial, difficulty, uncertainty, and at times, utter despair for this couple. God, who certainly doesn't seem to work at the pace that we would like him to, nonetheless, in the end, is true to the promise that he makes to Abraham and to Isaac. And finally, Rebekah becomes pregnant. And if you think that 20 years is difficult enough, well, it doesn't get any better. Because what happens once she becomes pregnant is no plain sailing for Rebekah either. The two boys growing inside her struggle together, a portent of what's to come. And such is their behavior that in exasperation, Rebecca cries out, if it's to be this way, why do I live at all? And so she expresses to God and asks him, why is this so? Why are these two boys behaving like they are? To which she receives the reply, the elder shall serve the younger. It might sound a bit cryptic to us, but we'll get it in a moment. The elder shall serve the younger. And so after nine months of wrestling each other and jostling for prime position in Rebecca's womb and doing whatever twins get up to in the womb, Esau is born first. And not to be outdone, Jacob comes out next. Not after a decent length of time, but holding on to his brother's heel. And his name Jacob means literally, he who grasps the heel, or more figuratively, the one who supplants. And for much of their early life, Jacob sets about doing just that. And these two brothers are certainly very different from each other. Esau was hairy, Jacob wasn't. Esau was a skilled man, a man who worked in the fields. Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Esau, impetuous, living for the moment. Jacob, cunning and a schemer. Isaac, the father, loved Esau. Rebekah, the mother, loved Jacob. Which 
If you're about to have children, I know most of our families have gone out at the moment. It doesn't help brothers get along if parents behave that way. It certainly doesn't lead to good family relationships. But somehow these differences and all these things that go on, not only in the womb, but also in their relationship and differences to each other, lie at the heart of the brother's relationship with each other. A relationship that is at best strained and at worst hostile. And one can't help but think that Jacob is the cause of most of the problems. Much of the tension in the relationship between these two brothers revolves around birthright and blessing. They're not the sort of thing that we really actually have a lot uh, you know, to do these days. We don't tend to believe so much in birthright, maybe a little bit more in blessing. But we encounter the issue of birthright in today's reading, and the blessing comes a little bit later if you were to read Genesis 27. But they go hand in hand. Birthright was simply the eldest son's right to have twice as much of the inheritance as his younger brothers, maybe even more. But it also gave the eldest son the right to be, if you like, the ruler of the family clan. And so the birthright was a really important thing for that first child. Blessing, on the other hand, was the powerful final wish of the dying father on the one who had the birthright. And this blessing had real power. People in the ancient world believed that the blessing of the father upon the oldest son was not just a blessing of words, but actually had real power to it, a virtual guarantee of success and prosperity. Now, Jacob, the younger of the two by just a matter of moments, has no intention of letting Esau have either of these things, even though it was Esau's right as the older son. And so one day, Jacob, the domesticated homeboy, is at home in the kitchen cooking a stew. And Esau, who takes after his father when it comes to the joys of homemade stews, comes home from a physical day's labour in the fields, absolutely famished. And Jacob's stew will do the job. Now, I'd like to say that Esau asked politely, but you never get the impression that politeness is the most valued quality between these two brothers. And so Esau almost demands, not a please or a thank you insight. And Jacob, who never takes a backward step anyway, uh, in his whole life he never takes a backward step, decides to test the waters, see what his cooking is worth. And so he says to his brother, well, you can have some of that, but first of all, sell me your birthright. Notice how Jacob doesn't say, give me your birthright, but sell me. Jacob knows that he won't get it for free. And I have to say that Esau at this point sounds a bit like a drama queen. You know, I'm about to die. Well, I know hard work is hard work, but very few people die necessarily from a day out in the field. I'm about to die. What use is the birthright to me? And Jacob, who could have been a lawyer, gets Esau to swear an oath first. And so Esau does so, and he sells his birthright to Jacob. Ironically, both brothers get their hands on what they came for. Esau, a full belly, Jacob, a birthright. Although for Jacob, a birthright is only half of what he feels he needs. A birthright without a blessing is useless. And not prone to doing things by halves, Jacob and Rebekah, and unfortunately Rebekah is as cunning and devious as her son, Maybe that's where he got it from. They plan and scheme against old hapless Isaac. And before Esau knows it, Jacob has both birthright and blessing. Jacob believes he has secured his future. He has made it. And Esau, well, he just fumes and hates his brother and wishes to kill him as soon as the old man has sort of rolled off this mortal coil. 
But the deep sadness in this story isn't the falling out of brothers, although that is a tragic tale. Rather, it's one we ourselves may be only too familiar with. Remember those words that God says to Rebecca when the boys are causing mayhem in her womb? The older shall serve the younger. You see, God has already promised Rebecca that Jacob would have first place. As Stan Mast notes, all the things Jacob tried to get by deceit, he would have gotten from God anyway. The problem was that Jacob and Rebekah couldn't see how God could do that. So Jacob, with his mother's help, takes things into his own hands. Does that sound familiar? How often have we done that? How often do we do that? You see, Jacob wants the promise. He wants the blessing. But he also wants to control the how, when, and where all that will happen. In other words, he doesn't trust God. He doesn't trust God to do what God says he will. Now, I can't speak for you good people, but these are constant challenges I face as a person who seeks to live by faith. You see, God just doesn't work fast enough for my liking. And God doesn't always seem to work things out to my liking. And I think that from time to time we're all tempted to help God out because somehow we know best. But what I need and what I suspect maybe we all need to remember and trust is that, as Paul wrote, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. You see, the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob tells us that trusting God requires patience. And all three of those men struggle with that. I mean, who of us doesn't? Patience isn't always a quality found in overabundance. But the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also tells us that God fulfills his promises. God brings to fruition all that he desires for the whole world. You see, God is always true to himself. God is the God of salvation, of promise, of love. And if there's great hope for those of us who seek to be faithful, but find ourselves trying to move God on along more quickly, maybe, and in line with our desires, it's simply this. For all Jacob's failings, and you can read the rest of his story if you want to, and he's got more failings than a lot of us put together. For all his failings, for all Jacob's attempts to control everything, God still works with Jacob and works in Jacob. And I find that to be a really encouraging thing. For all my failings, for all our failings, for all the times when we don't live by faith, but by our own strength, we need to hear these lovely words of reassurance and faith that we find in the story of Jacob and Esau, but also we find in Paul writing to the Philippians church, where he says simply this, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We sit here today because in some small way, God has begun something in us through Christ Jesus. And I'll be the first to put my hand up and say there have been numerous times where I have felt that God should be doing things a bit quicker and a bit more in line with what I think should be right. And I, like Jacob, have tried to control what God does. 
But I am confident that he who began the good work in all of us will, even maybe in spite of us on occasions, carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And this is the faith we aspire to. This is the hope we have. This is the life we live. Entrusting all things to God. How hard has it been over the last 16 weeks, whatever's happened to us, to entrust those to God, to believe in the promise he has given to us that in Jesus Christ we are saved and found and made whole and healed and in a relationship with God the Father. Has it been difficult to entrust ourselves to that promise and that hope? And if it has, you're not on your own because we're all in that boat at some point. But the great thing of faith, the great hope we have in Jesus Christ is that we entrust all things to God, yes, even ourselves. For the testament of the gospel and the testament of God that comes in Jesus Christ is that God is always true to himself and that God will fulfill his promises, not only to Jacob, but to us as well. And for that we should be thankful. Amen.